Tonight we're going to be going verse by verse in the book of Isaiah. So if you need a copy of God's Word and you do not have a copy with you, you can raise your hand. And this faithful gentleman will hook you up with a copy of the Scriptures to follow along with us. We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 14. And uh, kind of excited about it. This is a a neat chapter, unique to everything that we know and experience as human beings here on planet Earth has some effect from this story that we're going to go through in Isaiah 14 tonight. So uh, real excited about that. And uh, so we're going to open up with a word of prayer and we're going to do a deep dive into this chapter. Uh, So let's pray. God, we thank you. God, we thank you for your mercy to us, Lord. Lord, you desire, Lord, to uh, not only bring us into the kingdom of heaven, but Lord, you desire to allow the kingdom of heaven, the fellowship with the king of heaven, that's you, Lord, to be manifested in us through the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would uh, come into this room, come into the rooms of those that may be listening via podcast, via live streaming, social media, our website, whatever they're streaming from, whatever. God, that that you would uh, allow your Holy Spirit to come alongside and teach us. Help our hearts to be open. Help us to be that fertile soil tonight, Father, where the seed landed on it and it produced 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. Why not a million-fold, right? Just, just let the fruit flow as we meditate on your word. Thank you for the time of worship. And so now we open up our hearts to your word. I ask that you'd open up your word to our hearts and speak to us now, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. All right. So we're going to be in the book of Isaiah chapter 14. And the title of tonight's message I put here is falling in line with the Lord or Lucifer, question mark. Falling, that's a key word in this chapter, in line with the Lord or with Lucifer, all right? Now, if you've been, um, and I'll put the memory verse out here, this is kind of one that hopefully uh, connects us more deeply with the meaning and the message of the chapter tonight. 2 Corinthians 2.11, this is Paul speaking, so that Satan will not outsmart us, for we are familiar with his schemes. Paul talks about us not being ignorant of the devil and his schemes, the enemy and his schemes. And so we're plowing through verse by verse through Isaiah, which is a phenomenal book quoted I want to say about a hundred times at least, it was either 90 or a hundred times in the New Testament. So there is great relevancy to our walk with Jesus and understanding his word in this regard. And, um, and the Lord has much to say. Now, contextually, just to give you a little you know, snapshot update, if you've not been with us, and I would encourage you to go through since we're in the early part of Isaiah, go back online and maybe listen to some of the studies to get further insight. The first six chapters deal, Isaiah is prophesying in the reign of King Uzziah. There's four kings it talks about the beginning of Isaiah that he's prophesying underneath of. And tonight actually ends the King Ahaz that he prophesies under. It's Uzziah, Jotham, Uzziah's son. We don't hear a lot about him in Isaiah. And then Ahaz, which from chapter 7 to the end of chapter 14 the prophecy comes forth during those king's reigns. Now, the segue for Isaiah 13 and 14 is kind of one unit. And Steve did a great job, and I would encourage you to listen to his study. And I'm going to actually, if you you got your Bible, I want you to take a turn a page back. I'm going to look just a couple of sections of Isaiah 13 because it paints the backdrop for Isaiah chapter 14. You know, it's uh, God speaking of the burden against Babylon. Now, when we talk about prophecy, the prophets did something unique, and God did something unique through them, and we see it illustrated 
are pictured in Isaiah uh, in some unique ways where he's prophesying to the near, which means he's prophesying to something that may be imminently happening in his day. But then sometimes the prophecy broadens out to a further time period into the future. He looks through the tunnel of time. Somehow his dependency upon the Lord causes him to see things God just reveals especially to him. You know, like the Emmanuel prophecy in Isaiah 7 is a classic example. We went through, Steve taught us that study, I believe, where it's speaking of, you know, one being born, a God with us. And there's some sense that may be Hezekiah or the next king, but then you start looking at the details. And you're like, whoa, wait a minute. This is not the next king that's coming down the pipe. This is something else. And then Matthew confirms that, right? It gives us the you know, interpretation of what that prophecy is about Jesus. So we see that throughout as you go through these prophecies. But you know, the prophecy was against Babylon in chapter 13 of Isaiah. But it's not just Babylon, which is about a hundred or so years after Isaiah lived, comes on the scene as a world power, Nebuchadnezzar, right? It's not just that, actually about 120 years. But it is, and that is a Babylon. Steve talked about Babel in Genesis 11, right? Tower of Babel, some of the same spirit, I believe, working behind that. And then in Nebuchadnezzar's day, that time period, Chapter 13 mentions that, but it also speaks more specifically of the future Babylon, Revelation 17 and 18. And so I would encourage you, if you're really trying to get into the Word, understand these things, you know, uh, 13 and 14, we're teaching on those. Uh, Jeremiah 50, 51 speaks more specifically about, in more detail about Babylon. And then Revelation 17 and 18 talks about the Babylon, which we get details of as we look at tonight's chapter. But Isaiah 13, let me look at a couple of verses uh, together with you if you want to look at these with me. Key phrase to understanding this is not just talking about Babylon, but it speaks of a future events. Verse 6 of 13, it talks about the day of the Lord. Well, for the day of the Lord is at hand. That phrase, the day of the Lord, speaks of that um, day of judgment on planet earth. Revelation 6 to 19. But it talks about there, it says it will become as a mighty destruction from the Almighty. Verse 7, therefore all the hands will be limp, every man's heart will melt, they will be afraid, pains of sorrow will take hold of them, they will be in pain as a woman and childbirth, there in verse 8, they will be amazed at one another. So we see some of this mentioned in Jesus' time about the great tribulation, Luke 21, Matthew 24, Mark 13, birth pains, Right? Speaking of the last days, in verse 9, the, behold, the day of the Lord comes with cruel wrath, fierce anger to lay the desolate. He destroys its sinners from it. The stars of heaven, their constellations will not give light. Jesus talks about this in all of that discourse. The sun will be darkened and it's going forth. And I found it interesting last week when, or two weeks ago when we were reading this, you know, Bill Gates is... And I, and I don't know but how much of this is going to come to fruition. It's talking about coming up with a plan to dim the sun, you know. And we're literally like reading this in Isaiah. <laughs> you know, it's kind of just interesting. But you don't have to worry because the gates of hell will not prevail against, right, <laughs> the Lord. But no, so you see these pictures of the Lord in the day of his fierce anger, verse 13. We see these descriptions in verse 19. It talks about God will overthrow Babylon, like Sodom and Gomorrah. That is, these things have not yet happened. And even 170, 100 or so years from now, you know, from Isaiah's time period, Babylon would cease to exist. So we see this inner working. Babylon is being judged in Isaiah 13, and Isaiah 14 rolls into something different. So we pick up here in verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 14. And it says, for the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will stu still choose Israel and settle them in their own land. So God has dealt with Babylon in judgment in Isaiah 13. And we'll talk a little bit tonight about the king of Babylon being judged and the power behind the king of Babylon. But we see God showing mercy. This is an entrance, if you will, of God placing 
His chosen people into the land, an entrance into the millennial. Now we see Isaiah 11, 11 through 12 talk about a little bit of these details of bringing the nation back together. It says, and it shall come to pass in, the, in that day that the Lord will set his hand against the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria, Egypt, from Pathros, Cush, and Elam, and Shinar, from Hamath, and the islands of the sea. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together the dispersed of the, you know, from the four corners, corners of the earth. That's the Lord gathering his people together. Now, today there's about 15 million Jews, roughly, maybe a little less than that, a little more, on planet Earth. Seven million or so live in Israel. So there's going to be, there's still more work to be done. They've gathered together as a nation, but there will be more coming together according to these prophecies. Now, I love this phrase in Isaiah 14, and we'll get to the next part of this soon, but God will still choose Israel. God still chooses Israel in spite of the rejection of Messiah, right? In spite of, you know, all the stuff we read in the Bible, right? You know, knowing of their rebellion, their, their things going on. And I think this is a way of encouragement for us is that God still, as us, as followers of Jesus, chooses us, allows us to be a part of his kingdom, you know, Revelation 17, 14, I love this verse I was reading as I was studying. Speaking of that time period even, it says, These will make war with the Lamb, the Lamb will overcome them, for He's Lord of lords and King of kings. And those that are with Him, those that are with Jesus, are called chosen and faithful. I like that. They're called by the Lord, we're called by the Lord, we're chosen by the Lord, and we're faithful. Why? Because He's faithful to us, right, ultimately. Now, Romans eleven twenty nine, 29, we know God's faithful to Israel. It says, for his gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. We talk about salvation in the New Testament as being a gift from God. It's not a fair weather friend gift. It's not, oh, you got saved. That's awesome. That's great. You know, hope you don't lose it. You know, it's, it's, God's not in that sense, in that way in the way he distributes things. I mean, how weird is it, right, if you gave a kid a gift or your child a gift and you took it back? Now, you, you might do like I do with my kids when they're not behaving properly. We take the gift away, <laughs> but we don't take it away permanently. We, you know, it's just like, all right, time out from the gift, right? But God is eternal in his nature and his giving and his calling. And the nation of Israel, he still chooses them. And the encouragement we gather from that is that when he chooses us, when we've accepted him, is that the life lesson I put here is that God chose you. It talks about he will complete you and he will never let you slip through his hands. God is a keeping God, as Pastor Dave like says that a lot. Now, it goes on there in Isaiah 14. So after this judgment of Babylon is, is set aside, is moved away, this economic powerhouse, this false religious system of what Babylon is in Revelation 17, 18, it's been judged. He brings, he faithfully chooses Israel, settles them in the land that he promised to them. It says the strangers will be joined with them and they will cling to the house of Jacob. So obviously not Jews are clinging to the Jews. Zechariah 8, 23 talks about the day of the Lord, says, says this about that day. It says, thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, 10 men from every language of the nations shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Isn't that cool? This is part of the millennial time period where the evil has been removed, the king or the Babylon has been judged. The city has been wiped out. Nations of the earth weep over it, right? We see that in Revelation 17 and 18. And I encourage you to read those chapters. We got time to go through all of it tonight. But they weep for it because it was their hope in this world. And it's now destroyed. Now the millennial reign is here. 
the Israelites are put back in the land. The worship of Messiah is taking place. And now people are clinging, wanting to learn from the Jewish people. We want to learn about your God, your Messiah. We want to know. You know, I love John chapter 12, verse 31 and 32. It's a great scripture for us as followers of Jesus now. It's now, now is this the judgment of this world. The ruler of this world will be cast out. That's actually, in a way, taking place in the millennial reign here. Verse 32, and if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. That's what Jesus is saying. And when we lift Jesus up, he's speaking of his death. Now, he's speaking of himself being lifted up, not like, look at me, I'm pretty. You know, it's not like that. We're going to talk about the enemy in a minute and how he does that, but it's lifted up. I'm killed, I'm crucified, I'm humiliated, I'm despised, I'm rejected, I'm persecuted, I'm ridiculed, I'm lifted up. But people will be drawn by that. You know, sometimes we go through our trial, our ridicule, our being despised or looked upon kind of quizzically or, you know, from others. But when Jesus is lifted up, people will draw people, it'll draw people in. It says all people in that verse. I looked up the word all, it's actually in the Greek. It's not ad for filler, right? It's in there. You know, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, so it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. I live by trusting in Jesus, the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He's lifted up when we're crucified with him, right? Galatians 6, 14 and 15. I love this statement, or Paul, or just 14, I'm sorry. Paul makes, he says, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The world is dead to me and I am dead to it and its desires and passions and all the evil that's locked up in it. When, we're, when the Lord is lifted up in our hearts like that, people will see him, right? People will be drawn to him. The life lesson is Jesus is lifted up in our life. He will draw people, all people to himself. Now, whether that doesn't, this isn't like something that you play the metric out like, oh, that means everybody will be attracted to him. No, people will be drawn. Now, what their response will be, it's up to them, right? That's, it doesn't indicate that. Sometimes they're like, oh, yes, oh, we'll be drawn to Jesus. You know, like it's a wonderful thing. Well, some might be drawn to him and then reject him. You know, it's not saying that that ain't going to happen. But, but anyway, so the millennial reign, Babylon is dealt with. The Jews are there. People want to learn at this point, right? Now, verse 2 says, Then the people will take them and bring them to their place, and the house of Israel possessed them for servants and maids in the land of the Lord, and they will take them captive, whose captives they were, and rule over their oppressors. Again, this is descriptive of Babylon, but this kind of thing never happened in historic Babylon, where the Jews were all of a sudden in charge of those that were sort of over them, maybe oppressing them, or people from that people group that had previously oppressed them, are now under the authority of the Jewish people, of those that come back and reign with Jesus in the millennial reign even. Now, verse 3, we segue into God speaking to the judgment of what goes on. It says, And it shall come to pass in in the day the Lord gives you rest from your sorrow, speaking to his people, and from your fear and the hard bondage in which you were made to serve. This is the persecution, the hardship, the Revelation 6 through 19, all the difficulty of that time period, right? That you will take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say how the oppressor has ceased, the golden city ceased, the Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers, he who struck the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he who ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and no one hinders. Now, very specifically, Revelation 17 and 18. Again, the backdrop of this is some of what I've just described to you 
events that have never taken place on planet Earth as it relates to Babylon. So we're looking through the tunnel of time at Revelation 17 and 18. We believe the king of Babylon, which would be the Antichrist, because we know the woman rides the beast is Babylon. And who's leading that woman that's riding the beast? The beast, right? She's not leading him, right? He's the one. He's the king of Babylon. So it's talking about how the Antichrist persecuted these Jewish people during that time period. Now we know in Zechariah 13, 8 and 9, we get more detail about how many people are left out of the tribulation period that are Jewish. It says, and it shall come to pass in the land, says the Lord, that two thirds shall be cut off and die. Now, I went over the numbers just a minute ago, right? Seven million in Jerusalem or Israel today, maybe 15 million worldwide, you know, give or take. I mean, imagine a third of that dying now. That's another Holocaust, right? Straight up, another Holocaust. But during that time period of the tribulation, two-thirds will be cut off and die. One-third should be left in it, and then one-third through the fire will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name. These are the true Israel. This is where Romans 11 talks about all of Israel will be saved. This is the all of Israel. This is the third that's left that will be saved. And I will answer them and say, this is my people. And each one will say, this is the Lord, my God. So this is the proverb they're bringing up against the king of Babylon, against Antichrist there in verse four. Now verse seven, it says, the whole earth is at rest and quiet. Why? Because this king has been taken away. His staff's broken, it says there in verse 5, because he struck all the people, hurt all the people, and now he's gone. They break forth in singing, verse 8, indeed the cypress trees rejoice over you, and the cedars of Lebanon saying, since you were cut down, no woodsman has come up against us. There's peace. There's peace. And a life lesson I put here is that we too have his perfect peace when anything we have in place of Christ in our life is removed. That perfect peace comes when he has our complete devotion. So the perfect peace of the millennial peace that these Jews are experiencing in our text here, it comes after Babylon's destroyed, the Antichrist is removed, right? And, you know, John, 1 John talks about you know, even now that there are little antichrists. And antichrist is just means, there's obviously the figure that we learn about tonight and the figure mentioned specifically in the Bible, the more climatic, you know, villain, if you want to call him that, that's, that's a real person, right? But there's the little antichrist that John talks about in 1 John, things that we just put in place of Christ, right? And sometimes we go through, God loves us so much, and he loves you so much, and he loves these people so much, he allows a little bit of refining so our dependency isn't upon our rudimentary way that we set up our day. I've got to do this at 4 o'clock, this at 5 o'clock, this at 6, no, this at the, you know what I mean? I'm a planner, and so I get frustrated when things don't go according to plan. But sometimes that's where my frustration, what needs to come in place of that, Faith, trust in the Lord. You know, I, I still think you should be wise and, and make good plans. You know, I mean, we plan to start at seven o'clock. We usually do, <laughs> you know, at least live streams up doing something at seven o'clock. <laughs> Praise God, God's mercy. But, you know, there's that dependency upon the Lord and, I, and I, that, that's so needed. And sometimes the Lord allows things to come into our life so that Maybe something that we've put in place of the Lord is removed so we can trust Him. And then we can get perfect peace. We're fully trusting in the Lord, right? I mean, think of our trust like, um, I don't want to get too deep on that. We've got a lot more to cover. I start giving illustrations and testimonies and just we, we have to go back later <laughs> and talk and read a chapter a night later. All right, let's pick up verse 9. Back to our context. So the Antichrist is persecuted. No one hinders. Verse 9, it says, Hell from beneath is excited about you. Now, I doubt this is like a literal excitement. 
like like hills that's sitting there really happy. Hey, Antichrist is coming out. No, I doubt that's what it is. It's just sort of uh, used as a description of the eagerness of justice to be served to this person. To meet you at your coming, it stirs up the dead for you. All the chief ones of the earth, it has raised up their thrones and all the kings of the nations. They all shall speak to you and say, have you become as weak as we? No doubt people in hell compare themselves to this guy that they've seen that exerted authority, power, influence, like the world's never seen. We know that the Antichrist descriptions, you know, I've covered him and Daniel a few times, you know, he's, he's charismatic, he's a likable person, which doesn't really fit any of the political people in our day. <laughs> he's probably out there, but, um, <laughs> but you know, but it's, he, it, this is his persona. And people, you know how they compare themselves with, you know, people compare themselves with other people sometimes. This is what seems to be happening. It says, and have you become like us, verse 11? Your pomp, your pride, has brought you down to Sheol, the place of the dead, and the sound of your string instruments. We'll note that is a characteristic of the enemy here in a minute. And the maggot is spread under you, and the worm covers you. You know, for us as, as believers, this is what it should be like. The cross is the great leveler. We're all equal. Man, woman, child, human being, race, ethnicity, fat, short, skinny, tall, yellow, black, white, red, whoever you are, human being, level at the cross. There's no, there's no like, Pastor Nick's up here and somebody else, no, that's Nick's probably more like that. <laughs> but you know, it's, 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 we're all level at the cross. We're the same blood of Jesus that forgives me, that forgives you. And we express our gifts differently. Our roles are different. We're different parts of the body. Like Paul says, we're not all an eye. We're not all a mouth. We're not all a hand. But we have an equal function, an equal representation before God through Jesus. It appears here, those that don't accept that, that are proud, hell is the great equalizer. Hell is the great equalizer. That's what we're seeing here with Antichrist descending into it. It's like, we thought you were awesome, man, on planet Earth. You were the man. You're like us. You know? People that follow after these major athletes, these major music stars, these major entertainers and influencers thinking they're all that in a bag of chips. You know, unfortunately, some, that road is a broad path to destruction, are going to look in hell and just be like, I listened to you, <laughs> you know, I was impressed by you, you're like me, you know, and they're not celebrating in hell, by the way, rich man proves that, no, we know Revelation 19, 20, the beast was captured. And with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image, these two were cast, listen to this, alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. So apparently Jesus, when he appears, if you read Revelation at the end of 16, you see the battle of Armageddon, Megiddo, it's talked about there. And... Um, then 17, it's an interesting sequence. Then 17, 18 talks about the great city of Babylon, how it's destroyed. And then Revelation, as we read in this verse here, 19, talking about the Antichrist and the false prophet. They're ultimately getting thrown in, straight into there, alive. They didn't necessarily say, you know, the Lord talks about destroying with the breath of his mouth when he appears. Didn't say exactly how that was playing out. Not like an insta-death for everybody in that moment, but apparently these guys are thrown straight in. So that's the end game for the Antichrist. Now, we get into this thing with Lucifer. Verse 12, it says, now, and this kind of like switches the gear slightly. We're talking about the Babylon being judged, Revelation 17 and 18, the false religious system, the economic system of Antichrist, and then the king of Babylon, Antichrist. 
And we kind of see in the next verse there in 12, the power behind Antichrist, who that is. It says, how you were fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, and how you were cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. Now, it is interesting. There was a, I think I said this a few weeks ago, on our men's study, you know, there's a couple third graders talking about the devil and asking each other, if, you know, is the devil really real? It's like, man, is the devil, you think the devil's really real? And they're saying, nah, man. The devil's just like Santa Claus. It's your dad. <laughs> that was funny. But, um, you know, my kids would say amen to that if I was disciplining them. But, um, but no, it's, you know, some people look at the enemy as though he's just, you know, just not necessarily a real being. And so there's a mistake there, obviously, right? But we, you know, we who follow Jesus, know the Lord, know the word. You know, it's not hard for us to see something else is at work in this world as opposed to just human beings. Now, we got the fallen world system. We got our flesh, our fallen human nature. And then we got the principalities and powers that exist that are behind the scenes. We'll look at another section about that, and we're going to cover this one too. But there's something evil at play. You know, I was, uh, I text the elders this week. I was at a store, you know, as a my business, a service contract, and, and there's this person yelling at this other person and just would not stop. And it started to stir some stuff up, and they brought in some other people. A fight broke out. There was a large crowd of people there. I was trying to get my job done, and I was kind of praying. You know, I wasn't really, I mean, you know, I guess the Lord just gave me a sense of not being fearful in that moment. I was just kind of like wondering where this is going to go. You know, I'm like, all right, Lord, what do you want me to do? (laughs) Am I supposed to jump in at some point, or am I just going to sit back and pray? And I thought for a minute, and I sent and text the elders. I mean, you guys pray, you know. And it was really just one person with a mouth that stirred up another person, that stirred up another person, and a small fight broke out, and eventually it broke up. Um, you know, but, you know, I was reading a story about another guy, this was a few years ago, it was somewhere in Chicago, these guys were eating pork chops, and one guy got a portion that was more than the other, the other guy was ticked, stabbed the dude in the abdomen, because he got more pork chops than them. It's like... You know, something's weird at play, you know. It's just like, really? <laughs> you know? Sometimes maybe you found yourself, I don't know, I've found myself getting, like, really in the weeds emotionally, maybe angry or uh, upset or just, you know, Argh! you know, and then you start taking a step back. It's like, wait a minute, I'm a Christian. All right, Lord, help me. <laughs> you know, yeah, help me calm down, not talk for a minute, not act for a minute. And then you start thinking, this is ridiculous. You know, something else is at play. And no doubt, something's at play here. We pick up in verse, we see there in verse 12. This refers to Lucifer. Now it says, you were cut down to the ground. There's a passage in Ezekiel, and I'm going to go back and forth here, Ezekiel 28, where we see the same principality and power, Satan, working behind the scene, and God describing him before he falls. We see him fall in, here in Isaiah 12, 14, 12. Ezekiel 28, verse 11, gives a description. It says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up this lamentation for the king of Tyre, and says to him, Thus says the Lord God. Now, if you want to read more on your own, you can read the first few verses of chapter 28. In chapter 26 and 27, God is dealing with this king, a person of Tyre. Okay? And it's uh, around uh, Ezekiel's time, so this is around the time of Nebuchadnezzar that actually wipes out the king of Tyre in, in reality. But it goes into this, okay, here's the king, but then it goes into describing a power behind that king. It says, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect beauty. This is a handsome devil, all right? Now, verse 13, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, the topaz, and diamond, and beryl, and onyx, and jasper, and sapphire, and turquoise, and emerald, and with gold. 
The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for, the, for you on the day that you were created. So we see this, obviously this is a description beyond the king of Tyre, talking about the Garden of Eden, right? Talking about perfect in creation. And there's sort of this musically gift behind this creation. And then it goes in further description, proving this is not the king of Tyre. It says, you were the anointed cherub, verse 14, who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. So God, he was in heaven. We see him in this perfect state, unfallen here. You were perfect in all your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. So this is this is before his fall, we see in Isaiah, right? The description. Now, I'm under the impression, I don't want to get deep on this. Some people expound this. If you have more questions about it, you can ask me. I'm, I know about it. But, um, you know, some people look at the fall of Lucifer as being something that uh, happened between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. I don't believe that um, personally. I can give you scriptural reasons why and give you some Hebrew things to research on your own, and then you could, I'll give you the material to debate me with if you want to debate it. But you don't have to. You don't have to get caught up in that. But you know, I believe, based on this verse, that this is, uh, there's a picture that the enemy was in the Garden of Eden and had not yet fallen. I mean, we see that, in a sense here, played out. Now, there are four falls of Satan. We're going to get into his iniquity in the Bible. And I'm just going to brief these, list these off. You want to screenshot it or whatever you want to do to dig into the verses or look at it. There's four falls that we see from Satan. Satan fell from the glorified to the profane. We just read there in Ezekiel. And this is somewhat of what Jesus spoke of in Luke 10, 18. Ironically, just like a month or so ago, some hip-hop artist came out with some shoe that had this verse on it. It was like Satan shoes, 666 written on it. There are only 666 versions. I don't know what this guy's doing. He's obviously just being, trying to get some attention, which is no different than the enemy. But anyway, and he says, when I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, this is the only fall of Satan that has already happened. So there's three more falls that Satan has. The second one, Satan will fall from having access to heaven. We see in Job chapter 1 that the enemy, he may have fell from his role, right? That's what we know of now. But he didn't fell from having access to heaven. You can look at those scriptures, Job chapter 1, Zechariah 3. And we see in Revelation 12, 9, you know, that he accuses the brethren day and night before God. So he's not in hell like some things want to illustrate, you know, the enemy. He's got his little pitchfork. He's in hell sitting on a throne somewhere. He is not yet in hell, folks. That is not truth. There's other people in hell that beat him to it. Antichrist beats him to it. You know, but... Hell, we don't want to get too deep on that. But the third thing, Satan will fall from his place on earth to bondage in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. We do see that in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. He's bound by a single angel, by the way. And number four, we see finally and mentioned Isaiah 14, 12, Satan will fall from the bottomless pit to the lake of fire, which is commonly known as hell. So he's going to be released after the thousand years to go deceive the nations again. And in Revelation 20.10, he's cast into hell permanently. Now, verse 13, we see uh, the description of his iniquity that was found in him. It says, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation, on the farthest sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. These are the five I will statements. And this is the first time in the creation of the heavens and the earth that we know of that another will was exalted above the will of God. Right? And there's so much self-centeredness centered around these. Now, I will ascend to to, to heaven I'm going to make heaven my, is going to be my place of honor. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I'll be a throne exalted above angelic beings. Um, we see a description we'll look at in a minute in Revelation 12 of the stars 
It's mentioned in Job 38, verse 7. It's not in my notes. If you want to look that up, stars are, are compared to angels. So that's kind of where you get that. But so I mean, he wants to be above the rest of the angelic host. That's what he's wanting. I want to be above the mount of the congregation. I want honor and attention above the congregation. I will ascend above the heights. I will continue to rise above the angels, above the congregation. And then it says, I will be like the most high. Notice he doesn't say, I want to kick God off the throne. That's commonly what people think. Oh, I'm just going to kick God off the throne. That's not what's happening. I just want to be like the Most High, equal in attention, if you will, given to the Most High. You know, it's interesting, Jesus, Lucifer, when Jesus was tempted in the desert after the baptism, right, for 40 days, you know, Satan tempted Jesus and took him up to the top, ascending to the top of the temple. That was his temptation for Jesus. And he says, you know, look at all the kingdoms of the earth that you see. If you bow to me, I'll give it to you. Now, Jesus, interestingly, did not correct him. Jesus didn't say, hey, you can't do that. It's not yours. Why didn't he say that? Well, the enemy, God had trusted creation to mankind. And when the enemy, when the enemy deceived Eve, and interestingly enough, what is it in, uh, we'll get to that in a minute. But, you know, he deceived Eve, asking her if she wanted to be like God. That was the same thing that those I wills, I want to do this, I will do this, I will do this, I will do that. Same temptation that he succumbed himself to. He tried to get her in, but man turned the title deed over to the enemy. And Jesus did not correct him. He did not say you can't do that. Now, ultimately, the works of the enemy were abolished by the cross, right? We know that. And we see in Revelation chapter 5 and 6, the title deed of planet Earth is sealed. The seals of judgment mentioned in Revelation, that title deed is handed over to Jesus, and he begins to take full ownership in Revelation of the Earth. But now he's given us the keys to the kingdom, if you will, by us accepting Christ to drive out the enemy. That's a whole other thing. But there's this attention, this self-focus, me, myself, and I. It's so interesting in America because a lot of stuff we have is centered around this very subtle idea of pride. You know, I will, I will, I will, I will. The middle letter of pride is I, right? This was all about Satan, all about me. And we have so many self-help books in our world, in our country. So many groups of people that are in positive atmospheres. I'm not saying they're not essentially nice and positive, but that coerce, promote, and exalt self. It's not about little pentagrams and sacrificing chickens and stuff. <laughs> Actually, the satanic Bible doesn't even, I mean, it's like discourages that. I don't even do that. I mean, Satanic Bible is all about exalting yourself. It's all about you, right? What do we know from the gospel? First Peter 5, 6, humble, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Mark 9, 35, and he sat down, called the 12, and says, if anyone desires to be first, you want to go to the top? Be last of all. And servant of all. The opposite we see of what the enemy does in Isaiah 14. Now back to the Ezekiel, we'll cross over and look at a couple more details concerning this iniquity that's found within Satan, right? This is where it begins. This, you thought sin was in the garden, well, yeah, yeah, but it began in the heavenly realm with the enemy. Ezekiel 28, 16, 19, it says, By the abundance of your trading, you have become filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub. Now, there's different angelic classes you read in the Bible. There's seraphim. We saw in Isaiah 6. That's actually the only time in the Bible they're mentioned. I'm going to go back and listen to that study. It's fun. 
And then there's cherubim. And then there's other angelic hosts. Okay? So there are different classes of angels. Lucifer, Satan, the devil is a cherub. But anyway, it's a whole other thing. Your heart was lifted up because of what? Your beauty. God had given him beauty, but his heart was lifted up because of it. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities and by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought you from fire from the midst. It devoured you. I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you and all who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall no, be no more forever. So there was this self-interest in beauty, in the way he looked. He's like, I look pretty good, you know. Have you ever Googled yourself, found a self-interest about, <laughs> about yourself? You know, there's our whole society in a lot of ways is centered around this kind of thing. It's a sort of a subtle Luciferian mindset. It's not that you're going to go out and buy those latest, greatest shoes. Look, oh, six, six, six. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's kind of like obvious this is stupid, right? Obviously, this is maybe evil. Obviously, there's self-interest there. But it's often a lot more subtle in its approach. It's like the enemy telling Jesus, you want to go to the top? Go to the top of the temple? You want to go to the top? of your company? You want to go to the top of this thing or that thing? Now, I put this slide up here. Some of the, why was Satan motivated like this? I thought this was a good little excerpt from, I think it was David Good's commentary. It says, the violence that he had, that spoke of there in Ezekiel, against humanity is perhaps explained by the idea that Satan rejected God's plan to create an order of beings made in his image who would be beneath the angels in dignity, so we understand that from those scriptures, it would be served by the angels in the present and would one day be lifted in honor and status above the angels. And obviously the Bible talks about us even judging the angels, human beings. Satan wanted to be the highest among all creatures equal to God in glory and honor. And the plan to create man would eventually put men above angels. He was apparently able to persuade a third of the angelic beings to join him in his rebellion. That's there in Revelation 12. Talked about a dragon swiping a third of the stars, picturing angels to be on his side. So we see the enemy wants to take credit and personal applause. He wants that, that kind of attention, instead of giving God glory. The enemy wants authority and influence over others. The enemy wants to be like God or equal to him. Remember, not overthrow God. That's again what people, commonly people think. Yeah, he just wants to throw God off the throne. And he tempts Eve with the same thing. For God, says Genesis 3, 7, For we know, God knows in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Knowing good and evil. We say we want to be like God as Christians, don't we? I want to be like God. The question is not just that, but it's why do you want to be like God? Why do I want to be like Jesus? Is it so that I can draw all men to myself? No, well, he was despised, he was rejected. He was ridiculed. That was him being lifted up to draw all men to himself. Do I want to be like that? I want to be ridiculed. <laughs> it's like, no thanks. <laughs> you know, shy away. Nor are we supposed to be like God. Philippians 2, 3 through 8. The amplified version of this, pretty detailed. It says, do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit through factional motives or strife, but with an attitude of humility, being neither arrogant nor self-righteous. Regard others as more important than yourselves. 
If you read that in another translation, you hear about self-esteem a lot. Have better self-esteem. Self-esteem with only, like King James, New King James, it says the only word, time you see the word self-esteem together in the same scriptures are there in the other, those two translations. But it says esteem others better than yourself. But anyway, do not look out for your own interest, but the interest of others. Have the same attitude yourselves, which was in Christ Jesus. Look to him as your example in selfless humility. Although he existed in the form and unchanging essence of God as one with him, possessing the fullness of all the divine attributes, the entire nature of deity did not regard equality with God, a thing to be grasped or asserted, as if he did not already possess it or was afraid of losing it, but emptied himself without renouncing or diminishing his deity, but only temporarily giving up the outward expression of divine equality and his rightful dignity by assuming the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. He became completely human, but was without sin, being fully human, fully God and fully man. And after, after he was found in terms of his outward appearance as a man for a divinely appointed time, he humbled himself still further. He went downward by becoming obedient to the Father to the point of death, even death on a cross. So the question is, is, well, I'm supposed to be like the Lord. We know Lucifer obviously went the wrong direction. He wanted to be like the Lord and seated on the throne, the influence, the influence. So obviously that's not the way to go about it. It's the way we saw right there, right? How do we become like the Lord? How do we become like the Lord? 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed in the same image from glory to glory by the Spirit, not by seminars, not by, you know, not even by devotions or Bible study, I mean, in and of themselves, right? But by the Spirit of the Lord. We're transformed by the Spirit of the Lord. It's the Holy Spirit hanging out with Jesus, right? Like in Acts chapter 4, they hung out with Jesus. They noted, these scribes and Pharisees noted, these were uneducated people. That guy's kind of dumb, ain't he? Yeah, he's really, he ain't that smart at all. He's been with Jesus, (laughs) you know? Isn't that cool? Would you rather be a scholar or would you know a lot of stuff about the Bible or would you rather be... Hey, I just know Jesus, man. <laughs> you know? I'd I prefer to be with Jesus. You know, I want to know the Word, but I mean, I want to, I want to know the God of the Word, right? Moses, that, that depicts, that's an extrapolation, that verse, and it talks about Moses in that chapter in 2 Corinthians. Moses didn't know that the glory was beaming off his face. You know, he was just hanging out with God for 40 days. Beam, light, light bulb, light bulb moment, you know, the 100 watt bulb coming down. Oh, Moses, yo, put a lampshade on that thing. What are you doing? <laughs> He's like, oh, sorry, I didn't even know. <laughs> it was, he didn't know. A lot of times the glory of God is at work and we don't even know. You know, I was having a day, of, it was like three weeks ago. It's one of those days where, I don't know, like, way of illustrating it, it's like you step on the rake. You know, I didn't literally step on a rake. But you know, I step on a rake, it hits you in the face or something. Step on a rake, hits you in the face. I feel like everywhere I was going that day, I was like stepping on a rake. Boom, boom. Circumstantially, you know. Boom, boom. Boom, boom. You know, I'm like beating myself to death with just circumstances of life, you know. And I'm struggling. I'm mad at myself. I'm kind of arguing a little bit with God, too. And it's just one of them kind of days, you know. I mean, God's merciful. He didn't wipe me out. And then there's this guy. I'm going into one of these accounts. Apparently, when I was a youth pastor here a few years ago, like a decade ago, but um, more like 15 years ago, but <laughs> early in the church life, hey, I was his youth pastor, and he's, he's a grown dude now. He's got his own child, 25, 26 years old, and this guy is beaming with joy. I mean, this dude is like on fire for Jesus, and he is sitting there like building me up, encouraging me, talking about all this awesome stuff, apparently, that I did as a youth pastor and all this stuff, you know, and I'm sitting over bruises all over my face from stepping on rakes all day, 
And I'm just like getting blown away by this guy. And I'm like, dude, where are you? you sound like you're talking about somebody else. Are you sure you're talking about me? Are you talking about somebody behind me? Is this? I mean, he was just really encouraging me. I was like, wow, you know? It's like, you got the gift of encouragement, you know? <laughs> or something, totally. But it was unbeknownst to me, God used me at some point in this person's life to bless them. And they were excited about it and encouraging about it. And I was like, dude, you're like Barnabas. You're Barney the dinosaur. You need to hang out with me, man. Just walk around with me. Encourage me all day. Any more of you in my life. But um, I should have hit the record button and just listen for a few minutes. No, but, um, no, but it, was, um, it was totally the Lord. I mean, I knew it was the Lord. You know, he wasn't praising me like that. I mean, he was just, you know, he's like, hey, I give all glory to God, you know, and all this stuff. I'm like, oh, well, cool, praise God. But God often uses us when we're not expecting him. We're not perceiving it like Moses, right? He didn't really perceive that he was glowing, right? He was probably thinking about, what am I going to eat next? You know, it comes down off the mountain and all these people are like, oh, we can't see. You know, but anyway, life lesson is, is that the more we become like the Lord, we become more like the Lord when we, like the disciples and Moses, hang out with him. He makes us more into his image, and often we are unaware of it. Perhaps our head would explode if we saw how God was really using us, right? <laughs> you know? We don't want to become like Lucifer in that. But no, verse 15. Continuing on, speaking of the enemy, it says, You shall be brought down to Sheol. The lowest depths of the pit, verse 16, those who will see you will gaze at you and consider you, saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world as the wilderness and destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of his prisoners? People, as Satan enters into hell, people were blown away just like they were blown away by Antichrist. And how powerful and influential he was, being a nobody. And the enemy, people will look at him and be like, really? What? Devil? Huh? That's you? That's all you got? That's all you are? You shook up the world? You? What? People are going to just be blown away by how much of a nothing this created being was. And there's two things at play in believers. You know, there's the tendency to, people are, um, he's either, Satan's either like overestimated, like put on level of being God's opposite, which he is not. We see clearly from these scriptures, he is a created entity, a being, and there's no one like God. That's what sets him apart as holy, it's not like you know, those old South Park cartoons with Jesus and Lucifer fighting in a boxing ring. Nothing like that. You can't even compare to God. Not, not anywhere near him. You know? So people conflate the enemy being as that big, but also he can be underestimated in some ways. His influence is pretty powerful, but truth, his frame, is not. Revelation, or 1 John 4, 4, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than than he who is in the world. Jesus even refers to the enemy as being the prince of the ruler of this world. Revelation 12, 10, 11, it says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who has accused them before God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Those are three ingredients for a powerful life of walking with God, covered in his blood, forgiven by him. Your testimony is like a silver bullet shooting into the heart of the enemy. And you don't love your life to death. It's not all about you, right? Now back to verse 18. Now this switches gears. We're going to pick up the pace and go through some more text here. It goes back to the Antichrist. It says, now all, all the kings of the nations, all of them sleep in glory, everyone in his own house. But you are cast out from your grave like an abominable branch, like the garment of those who are slain, thrust through with a sword who go down to the stones of the pit, like a corpse trodden underfoot, yet you will not be joined with them in burial, 
I think that's interesting because he was thrown straight into hell. You know, he didn't get buried. Because you have destroyed your land and slain your people. Now, your land, your people, people tie this in as being a characteristic of Antichrist being Jewish. Now, we know that in the middle of the tribulation, and part of Revelation 12 centers on that, if you look at the book of Revelation, but that the temple is built, and Antichrist sets himself up in the temple and tells the Jews to worship him. He puts himself up into that thing. No doubt he's in influenced by Satan to do that, right? And so there's that description of him being Jewish, the land. He's slaying your land, your people. So he slayed, like we talked about earlier, two-thirds of the Jewish people are in part, was in part of that in the Great Tribulation. The brood of evildoers shall never be named. Prepare slaughter for his children because of the iniquity of their fathers, lest they rise up and possess the land and will face the world with cities. There is regime will fail. Verse 22, for I will rise up against them, says the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name of the remnant and the offspring and the posterity, says the Lord. I will also make it a possession for the uh, porcupine. Now, this is, I think the Hebrew uh, actually talks about, calls it the bittern. It's actually a type of bird. It's not a porcupine. You think, what in the world is a porcupine doing here? Just like sticking out in the middle of all this stuff going on? Um, but this is after things have been wiped out. It says, in marshes of muddy water, I will sweep the broom of destruction, says the Lord of hosts. So just like the sweep in sports, everything's wiped out, right? All the Babylon's being wiped out there. Now, verse 24, the Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, surely as I have thought, so it shall come to pass, and as I have purpose, so it shall stand. This is a really cool verse concerning God. God thinks it, it happens. Don't you wish things worked like that for you? At least once in a while. Now, obviously, it would be terrible if it did it all the time because our heads are not right. But, you know, I love these verses. Psalm 30, 139, verse 17, 18. How precious are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I could count them, they would be more in number than the sand. God's thoughts toward you and, and the goodness of those thoughts are massive. They're ginormous. And yet we get caught up in the world and complaining and not being content with this. You know, this hurts. I didn't get what I wanted over here. That didn't happen over there. We get caught up in this superficial way of thinking sometimes. Yet we could immerse ourselves into what God thinks of us. And knowing that His thoughts toward us are super good in massive amounts of you can't even count them so I tell this to my kids like you need to count your blessings when you go to bed (laughs) until you fall asleep count them count them count them count them count them thank God for what you know you have just keep doing it until you fall asleep because my kids are toddlers and they have super energy and they're up all the time and I'm not (laughs) able to be up all the time but anyway or Jeremiah 29 11 says, For I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Unfortunately, only in that promise, in that context, only a remnant experienced getting to go back to the land and rebuilding the temple and all that fun stuff that God had in mind to do. They didn't put themselves in the place where God's thoughts were being communicated, where there was community around God's thoughts, right? So important, man. I mean, there's so many people I see on a regular basis. I ask them about church, and it's treated very lightly. It's like they have a belief in the gospel. They, you know, they have a belief that the Bible's true, and, and it's like, well, you know, the New Testament is like basically written to churches. You should be in one, you know? You can come to ours, you know, I mean, watch on the line and then come, whatever it may be. But it's a community where we're surrounded God's word. We're, we're, we're seeing what he has to say. We're experiencing the testimony of other people in the body of Christ to lift us up, to encourage us. It's where we find other Barneys, Barnabases, right? Not Barney the purple dinosaur, but <laughs> Barnabases that help encourage us to build us up, right? We're having a down day. Come into the spout where the blessings come out, man. Stick with it. I mean, I ain't saying, you, obviously, you, 
do that in your personal devotional life as well. But anyway, get to too deep, too deep. And it says now, verse 25. That, then it, it, it's, it, some people say it transitions. If you take it in context, this is a continuation. And it was used in this context in a previous chapter. The Assyrian here in verse 25 said, I will break the Assyrian in my land on the mountains and tread them underfoot. The near sight prophecy is that Hezekiah, the Assyrian, will come down and God strikes them with an angel, destroys them. Definitely could be that. In the far sight, this could, the Assyrian represents Antichrist. And the mountains are representative of where Jerusalem is. It says, his yoke shall be removed them and the burden shall be removed from their shoulders. And this is the purpose that is purposed against the whole earth. This is where, again, that's the description that makes this a bigger thing than maybe just an isolated incident that's prophesied of in the near future. And it says, and the hand is stretched out over all the nations. The judgment of God is stretched out against them. And for the Lord of hosts is purpose, and who will annul it? His hand is stretched out. Who will turn it back? So this yoke is being going to be removed from the people. The yoke of Antichrist punishing the people or you know, making it hard on the Jewish people is removed by the Lord's return. Verse 28. This is the burden of which the year came, can the year of the king Ahaz died. Now we're ending the life of King Ahaz. We saw the end of the life of Uzziah in Isaiah 6. Ahaz was a bad king. I think this made Isaiah depend on the Lord in a way that was a little different. You know, you get a bad person in your life, a bad authority in your life. Maybe it's a boss. Maybe it's a government official. Honestly, I don't want to, want to go there with America because if you've been anywhere else on planet Earth, America is a truly awesome place, even if it's got corrupt leaders, comparatively speaking. And I've been in other parts of the world. Some of you have too. I'm just comparatively speaking. It's still like, super like a golden egg compared to everywhere else but anyway but put somebody bad in your life right that affects you personally Isaiah was in the king's court he probably had to deal with Ahaz periodically we saw him in Isaiah 7 deal with him right it makes you depend on God doesn't it and look at what amazing prophecies came out from his life in Isaiah 7 through 12 the prophecies about Messiah the the kingdom all the way into the future that we're looking at this came from a deep dependency upon the Lord during a time when things were rough for, for him personally, probably. Because yeah, the Bible says Ahaz was a bad king. Now, he goes into a pro new prophecy. This will finish these verses and finish up here. This is a new prophecy. It says, Do not rejoice, all you of Philistia, because the rod that struck you is broken. Now, if this is speaking of the far, and in the near and the far, the near could be that there is a situation where the kings of Assyria has a potentially oppressing the Philistines. Some people look at it like that. I think, I think it may be more of a far prophecy. It says, do not rejoice, you of Philistia, because the rod that has struck you is broken. I think it speaks of Israel that had in the past been a burden to Palestine, Philistine today, you know, Palestinians today. This is the same area that during this great tribulation period that the Philistines are rejoicing because the Israelites are being persecuted. And we know in 9-11, something of this nature happened where there was great joy in Palestine when the United States was attacked. And obviously we're allied with Israel, not saying we are. No, it is important, you know, when we look at this, what does God say not to rejoice over? I think interesting, Jesus said, don't rejoice that you have the power over demons, but rejoice that your name's written in heaven. Proverbs 24, 17, 18 says, do not rejoice when your enemy fails or falls. Do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles lest the Lord see it and it displease him, and he turns wrath away from him. So there's that part of our heart God doesn't want us to get caught up in the destruction of someone else, even if they're bad, right? Even if they 
might deserve it, right? You know, it's real interesting because we've seen this trial recently in our culture that happened. And I've seen people that, you know, I think of as sort of, I would say, before this event, for sure, that I would say, oh, yeah, they're, they know the Lord, they're mature. And there's a sense of, yeah, this guy got what was coming to him. Really? Do you want what could be coming to you apart from Jesus? I don't think any of us would, right? Well, it's an attitude to approach things. Maybe there's some wrong going on there. Maybe God is administrating justice. Don't get all excited about it. It's not the way of the Lord, man. The life lesson I put is don't rejoice at the fall of an enemy or power we have over the spiritual enemy, but rejoice that he purchased a place in heaven for you to be with him. You need to get caught up in that mindset. Now back to our text, uh, verse 29, don't rejoice, Philistia. The rod that you struck is broken. You know, potentially the Israelites, you know, being broken, don't get excited about that. For out of the serpent's roots will come forth a viper, and its offspring will bring, be a fiery flying serpent. So I think of some like dragon breathing fire, <laughs> you know, when I see this verse, right? So they're going to get it. You're going to start rejoicing over somebody that's, you know, going down? Oh, you know, well, you're going to get it too. And then it says, the firstborn of the poor will feed, will, will, will feed, and the needy will lie down in safety. I will kill your roots with famine, and it will slay your remnant. Now, the firstborn, we know in Exodus 4.22, that Israel is God's firstborn. So the firstborn of the poor will be fed. The needy will be safe. But I will kill your roots with famine and slay your remnant, Palestine, Philistines. Well, O gate, cry, O city, all you of Philistine are dissolved, for smoke will come from the north, and no one will be alone in his appointed times. Judgment will come on them too. They will be invaded as well, be it the last days, be it Assyria in a few years. Verse 32, what will they answer to the messengers of the nation? What are they going to answer them? These people that have sort of maybe in this position of potentially mocking Israel. It says that the Lord has founded Zion and the poor of his people shall take refuge in it. Kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. That Israel was chosen by the Lord. Israel is chosen by God. And the people around them are going to know it. We know it if you know the Bible, and if you've been here any length of time, we go through the Word, trying to go cover to cover, we see it's pretty clear. God's making it clear again tonight as we look at it. And I find it interesting. It, doesn't say, it says very distinctly this description. The poor of His people shall take refuge in it. Let me read this last scripture with you guys. I'm going to pray. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, this, you know, the Beatitudes, these are not things that you want to have on a resume, like currently, right? Blessed is the poor. I'm poor. Put that on my resume. <laughs> you, you want to talk about how good you are or how great you did something. You don't want to, but I'm, I'm a broke joke here, you know. But, but this is the, the attention that God gives to those that recognize that, really? And this is not, again, it's not only necessarily just monetary wealth. We really recognize that we're bankrupt in this life apart from Jesus. We're blessed because we can now receive in a purely dependent way the eternal kingdom. It becomes special to us when we realize that here on planet Earth, we're just a broke joke, man. But in His kingdom, oh man, there's riches, there's abundant life, there's joy, there's peace, there's forgiveness. There's so much that God has, so many thoughts that He has toward us. 
to give us peace, future, hope. It's all wrapped up in our relationship with him. It's all a good thing. I'm going to go ahead and close this in prayer. We're going to finish that out for tonight. Let me pray. God, thank you. Thank you for your word, Lord, and how your word tells us, and, and it is so true, Lord, as we see, Lord, the, the trials and the tribulation and how the enemy's trying to you know, use politics, use the Antichrist, use the systems of this world economically and religiously. He's trying to use that, and eventually he'll use it to a way where his power is stronger than ever. But as he's doing all those things, trying to create attention to himself, Lord, you step in and give us power over him by bleeding out your, your lifeblood out on a cross so that we can be forgiven and be in a right relationship with you and receive your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And so, Lord, we pray, God, that, you know, you're, it's, we know you're just the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, help us to... Um, Help us to fall in line with you in your ways. We know it's so opposite of what we're preached at if we watch any level of anything media-wise. We know it's almost the exact opposite, the way Jesus serves, the way Jesus you love, the way that you reach out. And Lord, you give us your peace and the confirmation from the Holy Spirit as we step out in faith to obey you and walk with you. So Lord, help us, Lord. Help us to be overcomers by depending on you in these days and allow you to do a great work in us. I pray. And may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face and his light shine upon you. May he bid you his peace, his shalom, in the name of Hashem Yeshua. That's the name of Jesus. And everybody said... Amen. All right. God bless you guys.